Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is somebody everyone knows and someone who knows everybody in Wadsworth, Virgil Hartman. Virgil, Glad to we are there. so pleased to have you on this program because you ran a business in Wadsworth for so many, many years and know probably every automotive person in Wadsworth. We're going to ask you a lot of questions about that, but before we do, are you sensitive about your age? No. Not at all. No. Tell us how old you are and when you were born, where you were born, and so forth. Well, I was born uh, September 13th, 1920, born in Guilford Township. Which is Wadsworth. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, my mom and dad's names were D. Forrest Hartman and uh, Molly Hartman. And Molly Hartman's maiden name was what? Schaefer. Schaefer. And what Schaefer family did she belong to? Uh, they came out of uh, Orville. Oh, out of and, Orville. Yeah. And uh, Dad lived uh, e or, uh, west of uh, uh, Ripman at the time with his mom and dad. And uh, they met uh, uh, at a social function of some sort, and, and uh, it bloomed into a marriage. Married to a marriage, <laughs> and you were born. And you were yeah. born here in Wadsworth, then. And you lived yeah. here, what, what's um, 78 years almost, yes. right? Well, that's. 78 yeah. passed, right? Mm -hmm. Passed, yeah. So you look good for 78. God bless you. You look really well, great. 78 I years. tried to take care of myself. <laughs> well, you, you had your early life on the farm, is that right? Yeah. And you know uh, what hard work is. four years. And you know what hard work is like. Oh, uh, well, not too much. Not too much? <laughs> not too much. Not four years old. Oh, four years old when, yeah. you, when you left the farm. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay, where did you leave, uh, where did you go after you left the farm? Well, we uh, went over to Route 3 and 224, and uh, Free Oil Company owned a, a service station there, and Dad started running that. The reason, reason being that uh, he had what they call at that time, leakage of the heart, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was a bad valve, wasn't yeah. closing properly. So he had to quit the farm work, and uh, uh, that was his profession from then on out till he passed away. And then that probably pretty well motivated you to become involved with automotives, is right? Well, my dad and I was pretty close, and uh, uh, he was a good teacher. He was, he was, <laughs> was he a good mechanic, too? Oh, yeah. A good mechanic. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes, but how about finishing <coughs> off your family here, brothers and sisters and so forth? Well, I have an older brother uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, Kenny Hartman. Ken Hartman. And uh, yeah. he was in the plumbing and heating right. business for a number of years, retired from that, and then opened the... Uh, a laundromat out at where Stop and Go is. Right, out there on College Street. Right. We have to be geographical here because 50 years from now, uh, Virgil may not be here. Yeah. So it will be <clears throat> approximately, um, uh, well, if the school is here, approximately a half mile west of the school, of uh, Isham School. Yes. Approximately on the same side of the road, yeah. north side of the road. And um, it will be, um, well, I guess, if the school is gone, people won't know where it is. But yeah. It's um, a half mile on the north side of the road, the laundromat mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, Norge, wasn't it? Norge. Norge. Yeah. Wal Wal uh, um, mm -hmm. Laundromat. And uh, your brother owned that. Uh, yes. He owned that. And um, he died, what, three or four years ago, wasn't it? Uh, could be three years. Yeah. I mm -hmm. don't remember exactly. Yeah. Three or four years ago, as I remember. Uh, everyone knew him, and of course he knew everyone. Yeah, Your whole family knows everybody, yeah. yeah. And then what about other family members? Well, uh, of course I had an uncle that lived here in town. And his name was what? Uh, Isaac Schaefer. Isaac Schaefer. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, he passed away a long time ago. His uh, wife lived up on High Street, I think it was. Uh, it was about the uh, fifth or sixth house up on the left-hand side above 261. On the, uh, it would be It'd then, be the it would be on the side. west side of the road, yes. um, just north of 261, uh, 
on the west side of the road. That is and, correct. And uh, that was a Schaefer family. Let's spell that Schaefer family because there are two different spellings in Wadsworth. Well, this one happened to be with one F, S-H-A-F-E-R. S-H-A-F-E-R. Then we have S-H-A-F-F-E-R and right. S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Right. Uh, so we have those spellings. We, <laughs> uh, they aren't related necessarily. No, they all, not all necessarily. The, because Schaefer is a fairly common Germanic name. Yeah. And. Um, what about Lyman Hartman? He was not related to you either, was he? Not that I know no, there's of. The, the, I the, had a grandfather that lived on College Street, Elmer Hartman. Elmer Hartman. And uh, yeah. when he passed away, I bought the home from his estate, 357 College Street. 350, which is opposite Osham School. Right across from right. it. All right, right from, uh, across from Osham School. Mm -hmm. And so we can identify some of the other Hartmans that you're not related to. You are not related to the Hartmans uh, who were uh, the Mrs. The Hartman who was married to um, uh, Everhard, right? Uh, no, there's okay. no All relation. Right. So there's no relationship there. Uh, my dad did have a brother that lived on the old homestead west of Ripman. West of Ripman, but not in uh, Wadsworth. Not in okay. Wadsworth, no. And what about younger brothers and sisters? <laughs> That's all. You were it, just the, the two of you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Two of you in the family. Yes. Now, <laughs> you say that um, you started out there on Route 3, Pure Oil, or the uh, Free Oil Company. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Free Oil Company, which probably doesn't exist anymore, does it? Uh, in a sense, it does. Uh, uh, they have changed the name. And to that, what? But now that I can't tell you. I don't remember. And tell us where Free Oil Company was in the well, area. Well, it was up at Medina. Medina. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be. Uh, Did they change to Ashland? Almost up to the square on the west, and uh, a little south, uh, about where the old Chevrolet. Uh, um, Gibbs Chevrolet dealer, dealership used Gibbs, to be. Was it? Gibbs, yes. Yeah. So um, I think didn't Free Oil go with Ashland then? Uh, I think it did. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it did. But what was Mark Ashland? Hazen was the Mark Hazen, in charge right. of the. They're a, a Sharon people, a Sharon group of people, the Hazens. I believe so. Right. Now, the Free Oil Company. What was the name of the gas that they sold? Shell. Shell gas. That's All right. shell products. All shell products, right? Then, did you stay out there at Route Three and and um, and Two Twenty Four, which of course is Greenwich Road now, yeah, and and Route Ninety Seven now, yeah, and yeah. Route Three is uh, also known as uh, Worcester Pike, isn't Three it? Three C Highway. Three C Highway, mm -hmm. which then changed to Worcester Pike. Yeah, and the reason they called it the Three C Highway was Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. That is correct. Right, it was Route Three going all the way from Cleveland all the way down mm -hmm. to. Cincinnati. It was considered a very good road at the time. Of course, very it good. has been uh, overshadowed tremendously now by turnpikes and mm -hmm. freeways and things of this nature. But at one time, it was a very, very good road. Yes. Now, did you stay out there very long, uh, Virgil? We was there two years uh, till they built the house on Acme Hill. And we moved there. And we didn't live there very long till I went to school. The uh, first year uh, I went to school was on my birthday, September, September 13th. September 13th, 1927. And last year, or it was on September 13th. Is that right? Yeah. Is that something? <laughs> yeah. That doesn't happen very, very no, often. No, it don't. Uh, what, um, where did you live on Acme Hill? Give us a geographical location of that. Well, uh, where the uh, service station and garage was, it was the first house to the west on the same side of the street. Uh, from uh, Acme Road, which goes straight south from there, it was right opposite Acme Road. Uh, the service station is right across from that. Right. And then to the west was the house. The house right to the west of that was mm -hmm. where you lived. Yes. Now, that's where you also had free, free um, the, not the free oil company. That was also a that, shell station there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about that and how that engendered your spirit of, um, of desire to become involved with automotives for the rest of your life. Well, uh, my dad was quite a, a fella as far as working was concerned. You had to do your daily chores, which whatever it might be. And uh, so I got interested in the 
and the mechanical end of it at a very early age. What were some of the first cars you worked on? Well, Model T Ford, older Buicks, Clevelands, Briscoes, uh, of course your three, General Motors and Chrysler and Ford. Well, actually, uh, um, Chrysler didn't come out until about 28, did it? Uh, the first Dodge, I think, was about 20, no, or was it earlier it than that? It was earlier was than it? that. Okay. I'd say 24. 24? All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my job was to clean up after him. That was the first job. Uh, when he got done working on a car, he had, he had to put paper down on the floor, so you scrape grease and stuff off. Why I have to clean that clean up. Clean the paper up. And now, go ahead. Now just go ahead. And uh, then I uh, helped to pump gas, and uh, then I advanced to where I would uh, do some of the mechanical work. And at about 10 years of age, uh, I was getting pretty good. 10 years of age, you were yes, getting pretty sir. good. Wow. Of course, your cars were very simple back then. I was going to ask you about that. Tell us, uh, as a matter of fact, I want to ask you two questions about the gas and the cars. Um, gas, gas prices, and gas pumps. Tell us how they have changed. Well, uh, as I remember, uh, we had a card up there that had the prices for a gallon, two gallons, so on, like it up to 20. And uh, by the way, uh, getting back to the one station over at Route 3, those were the old hand pump uh, pumps, and it, and it was my, my job to pump that and keep it full of gas. Okay, now tell us how that worked and how you knew that you had pumped enough or whatever. Well, it was a glass bowl, mm -hmm. and it was all maybe three, three and a half had. foot high, probably 14 inches in diameter. And it was graduated by quarters of a gallon. And you just pumped it out of the tank in the ground by a, a double pump. It pushed gas up both ways. And uh, then when we moved over to uh, Acme Hill, why you had more modern, they had the pumps right on the, when you lifted the lever, why it uh, would pump them in. Right. And the prices were, uh, uh, well, kerosene was a nickel a gallon, uh, gasoline with about four or five cents tax on it was uh, 17, 18, Cents back in them days in the twenties. In fact, we had one customer only bought a dollar's worth of gas at a time, which was quite a bit. You bet. But uh, uh, he had an enclosed car, and he'd roll a dollar bill up long ways, and he'd just open the window enough he could stick it out through the wind and pay you. <laughs> you remember who that was? Um, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. And where did he live? What kind of car did he have? Uh, he had a uh, Chevrolet. A Chevrolet, uh, mm -hmm. probably an old one. Yes, one of the first closed Chevrolets. Chevrolets they had. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, we didn't quite finish the story on the the glass tube, as it were, when okay. you had the double pump to fill it up. Now, w what would happen? You would um, a person co would come in and say, "I want five gallons of gas," let's say, mm -hmm. and you would pump until you would see this come up to five. No, you always kept it full. All oh, the time. I see. Okay. And then uh, it. Uh, you very seldom ever sold more than five gallon mm -hmm. gas back then because you didn't have the money. Right. But uh, if they wanted two gallon, you'd bring it down two gallon. You put the you put the hose in the in the gas mm -hmm. cap. You had a lever. You had to go over to it. Wasn't on the hose. You had a lever. You had to. You stood there and looked up at it, and then you'd shut it off. Mm -hmm. Drain the hose. <laughs> a little bit different. A little bit different. <laughs> Not a self-serve kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Was it hard to punch to to pump that pump? Not really. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. 
that high. Where was the gas? In the ground? Mm -hmm. And who would bring the gas and how would they bring it into you? Well, they'd bring it in a tanker uh, on a uh, truck bed. And you never had any delivered by, by horse and, and no, tank, though? No, not at that time. At uh, Standard no. Oil had uh, what they call Teamsters. I yeah. mean, who actually had teams of horses mm -hmm. that would go out and, 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 and drive this gasoline. I knew one. His name was um, mm, Louis Wurstel, W-E-R-S-T-E-L. Mm -hmm. Louis would probably be very close to 130 or 140 years old now. Oh, but he was yeah. an old, old man when I knew him. And he used to tell about being a teamster with Standard Oil and driving, <laughs> um, you know, um, a day's drive to um, from, uh, say, for instance, Cleveland to Wadsworth to fill up a tank and then driving back, mm -hmm. you know, probably, I don't know how long it would take, but uh, I don't know how much of an exaggeration this was, but nonetheless, it was something that, 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 that we know that did happen because it didn't have a lot of trucks at that time. Yeah. So a truck would bring that from the Free Oil Company in, yeah. in um, Medina. In, in fact, uh, if I remember right, I believe it was a Mack chassis, but it had a chain link drive drives the uh, from the transmission to the both back wheels and probably solid it wheels, was, huh? Solid wheels? No, oh. uh, they uh, they had the regular tires at that time. Regular the tires. younger ones were. Or, Older. older ones was that way. Now the chain drive, explain that chain drive and how those trucks would operate. Well, it was a transmission with uh, the gears that shifted it, but it had your opinions on both sides. It operated independently. Mm -hmm. You had an axle, but uh, it wasn't like a ring and pinion, and then your axles uh, coming out to the wheels. It was just a chain drive off the both sides of transmission. Did those trucks have power steering, Virgil? <laughs> no, <laughs> they, you had to use power to steer it. <laughs> no power steering. <laughs> no. no. Now, what about um, uh, uh, the uh, simplicity of the cars? Let's take a Model T Ford and tell us what that those engines were like to repair. What, what could be repaired in a Model T Ford? Well, you could do a lot of things with that engine that weren't normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First of all, it had a magneto system on it. Tell us why there's a difference between a magneto and a battery operated. Well, you had on those like a semi-automatic transmission. There was a row of U-shaped magnets on the flywheel. And there was a spark gap plug that went on the top of the housing that just cleared those magnets and that that created the the electricity to go to your buzz box which uh, then went it it uh, increased the electric uh, current and went to the spark plug then and was it a, was it a very efficient system well it worked it worked it worked good well, what about, how, did, how would you start it then? Well, you cranked it. Cranked it. There was no starters at that Tell time. Tell us how you would crank a, a car. Well, it had a, a crank on the front of it that hooked on to a, a, a pin on the front of the crank uh, of the motor, and it had a spring on it that it, when it started, it would help to pull it back so that you wasn't Mm -hmm. And once in a while, when uh, you was cranking and you didn't retard the spark, you'd pull it up and it'd pull it back out of your hand and hit you. Hit I've you. heard of a lot of... Show us how you would put your hand on a crank. Like this. With your thumb? Yeah. I thought you had thumb. to have your thumb underneath so that it wouldn't, um, wouldn't break your thumb off of it. Back well, you, you had to release real quick. Mm -hmm. If you felt it was going to kick back on you, you had to open your hand and get it out of the way. Otherwise, it would come back and hit, hit you. you. How many times did you have to turn the crank to make that thing go? Well, most of the time, maybe two or three. Mm -hmm. But you had sp spark control on your, on your uh, steering, steering housing, housing. And you also had a gas 
Uh, you didn't have a gas feed on the earlier ones. You, you had, had a throttle on the, on the steering on the column. On the steering column. Now, what did this spark control do? Well, that retarded the distributor uh, so that uh, it would not kick back on you. But if it wasn't set right, why? Uh, and even if it was set right, sometimes it would kick back on you. What kinds of things could go wrong with a Model T Ford, and how would you repair it? What kind of tools did you need to repair it? Did you have diagnostic well, equipment out there? <laughs> uh, Henry Ford was a genius. He, he sent one wrench along with each car that fit the spark plugs, the lugs on the wheels. Uh, you could do almost anything with this uh, wrench. And uh, uh, you didn't need too many other wrenches. Now, uh, I said uh, it was kind of an unusual engine in this, that uh, if a rod would, uh, the babbitt would break out of the rod, and uh, the guy, uh, one time we had a fella from Mansfield that lost a rod. Well, it just had a little pan about so deep with uh, hollow, shallow grooves in it where the oil stayed in there and would pick it up uh, with a, a dipper on the bottom of the, the rod. And uh, if a Bearing one out, you'd take a good piece of leather, wrap it around the uh, journal, put the cap back on, fill it an extra quart of oil in it, and he drove it clear back to Mansfield that way. <laughs> you couldn't do that today. Oh, no way could you do that today. No. What about uh, things like lifts? <clears throat> That would lift the car up into the into the uh, above so that you could walk under it. Did you have anything like that? Yes. And how? Uh, but that was in later years. But in the in the earlier years, what did you? How did you get under a well, car? You, you jacked it up with a screw jack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you had a handle that you could flip it to either raise it or lower, it, and you just kept jacking, and it turned this uh, screw gear like, mm -hmm. and shoved the screw up, and that's the way you were. Of course, back then they were so high you didn't need to uh, raise them up too much. The average um, height off the ground right now is for a car is about 9 or 10 inches, isn't it? Yeah. As compared to about 24 inches or uh, more. At least. Yes, at least 24 inches. Most good-sized men cannot get beneath a car today. No. Because it's too no low. No way. No, you can't do it. No. But at those days, you could almost walk under a car. Yeah. If you're kind of short, you could walk under a car. What about um, things such as uh, the transmissions and things like that? And this is extremely interesting. Believe it or not, uh, even though uh, many people don't know much about cars and so forth, the programs that we have had on the on this uh, on this um, uh, series that had anything to do with mechanics were some of the most popular ones. We had one on blacksmithing by Julius Pisanelli. It was extremely popular. I don't know how many people requested it. We had um, the, the way that bricks were made by um, 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 Pat Brannigan, and very, very interesting, and all kinds of people. We had um, the foundry by um, <clears throat> um, Walt Gehring, and mm -hmm. we still have people asking for that one. And uh, Leonard Kale did the one on the injector, and uh, Wes Allen on the match, and so forth. People like these mechanical things. So I'm, <clears throat> I hope you don't mind our asking about the mechanical no. things, because that's what you know well, and that's what people like to hear about. So now we uh, um, did, uh, how did you change oil, let's say, uh, on a car? Well, you had a, a plug on the pan that you would uh, drain the oil and then fill it to the capacity that uh, they recommended. Now, as far as uh, the Model T Ford, they had, like I said, kind of like a semi-automatic transmission. It had bands in it around the drum. You had a brake, you had a reverse, 
and you had a forward. And uh, you had three pedals. The right one was the brake, the center one was the... the uh, Reverse. Pardon? Reverse. Yeah. And the other one was uh, your low range, and then you had a like an emergency brake lever on the left side of you uh, that when you wanted to get in high, you put it forward, and that... <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me, that puts you in high gear. Then the uh, Model A Fords uh, had uh, just a regular transmission uh, made by uh, Ford itself. Later on, they went to Eaton transmissions in some cases, but uh, back then they were made their own. And uh, it was a, a four shift. You had a reverse, a low, Second and high. And With the clutch. Uh, clutch, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any heaters in the um, old Model Ts? Not them. There was in a Model A. And what was the Model A heater like? Well, it covered the exhaust manifold, and uh, then it had a uh, uh, steel uh, tubing that come inside of the uh, car. And you had a shutoff on it. Uh, uh, it. In the summertime, you didn't need it. You shut it off. Wintertime is just a little lever down on the inside of the compartment in the car. Was it very effective? Yeah, it did the job. It was did the, the job, the, of course. They took the, in, the heat of the engine and then transferred it in, inside the car. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. called a manifold heater, wasn't it not? Yes. And of course, they don't have those now. They yeah. have all kinds of heaters, but there are no manifold heaters. The um, numbers of years that you were out there uh, probably was, um, number of years was probably what, 10, 12, 15 that you were out there on the, far, on the hill? Uh, no, uh, it was uh, around 50. 1950. No, I mean, how many years did you stay out there? Oh, I stayed there till I got out of high school. High school, so about 15, 10, 12, yeah. 15 years. Where did you go to elementary school? Uh, here in Wadsworth at Isham. At Isham School, mm -hmm. centralized at that time. Yes. And what do you remember about centralized at that time? And this would have been probably in 1927, right? Yeah. Well, I uh, remember several of the teachers, uh, Mr. Rohr was one of them. He was on our program when they were he, celebrating the 70th, 70th anniversary of his graduating from high school. I'll be done. called last year. And uh, Ralph Rohr. Uh, he also then uh, was principal out there, if I remember right. I thought Vernon Isham was. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I... Uh, I thought before Isham, he, he was, maybe he was temporarily. Temporarily, maybe. I believe, because uh, J.B. Vining was the principal. But, mm -hmm. uh, Isham was there for all of the time I was there. Until he went to the service, right? Yeah. And who are some of the other teachers that you remember, Virgil? I can't really tell you. Can't you tell? The Laura Gates, probably. Uh, I wouldn't, if. Inus uh, Goodwin, is, who became Inus Rohr. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Iden. Yeah. Cooter. Cooter. Huff. Dorothy Huff. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. uh, Alvina Steiner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those people, the, the, yeah. the ones who would have been there at that time. Now, <clears throat> you went from there, you went nine years to that school, and then you went to the high school. Mm -hmm. And you graduated in 1938. 38. And who were some of the people with whom you graduated? Well. Who were friends of yours? Kenny Razor. Kenny Razor, who just recently died. Uh, Tom Cox. Tom Cox. Al Pfeiffer. Al Pfeiffer, yes. Ford Gogler. Ford Gogler. And uh, Merle Huff. Merle Huff. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Winkler. Harry Winkler. A uh, good friend of mine. Winklers lived out west of town. Yeah, they lived out on Acme Hill. Mm -hmm. He had a sister too, did he not? Yeah, well, there was, that was a pretty big family. Big family, right. Yeah. Uh, Doris, uh, huh. her, her dad was, uh, well, Tom Cox married, uh, her. No, Tom Cox married, um, 
Ruth. Um, or Ruth, Ruth I mean. Ray. Ray. Mm -hmm. Ruth Ray. Her her dad was a ma mail mail carrier. Mm -hmm. Dad, Bill Ray. Mm -hmm. Dad uh, kept his Plymouth going yes. during the World War II. He had a 1940 uh, or 41 Plymouth, did he not? Or 40, yeah. 30, 40? 40 or 41 40. Mm -hmm. Plymouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a... Uh, you couldn't get parts, but no, he had to, go, <coughs> had to go to the junkyard to get the parts. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, who are some of the other people you remember, you, you remember in those days? Well... Uh, Mary Feaster. Mary, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Feaster, her husband just died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, Virginia Shoe. Virginia Shoe. Uh, Virginia hmm, Cannon, I believe her name was. And uh, Helen Huff. Gosh, that's, that's going back too far. <laughs> that's going back to but you have a good memory. I, and I knew every single one of those persons that you mentioned because we all knew everybody in Wadsworth yeah. in those days. Then after graduation, which was probably 1938, Eight. as you say, uh, the war hadn't started yet. What did you do? Well, uh, I had a job down at the Ohio Injector before I graduated. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, how I got the job was uh, uh, when I was about 15 or 16 years old, <clears throat> my dad bought me an a electric welder. I loved welding and a settling outfit. And I used to weld on, on farmers, uh, whatever they had. Used to make new plow points and so on like that. and. Uh, the worst one was the manure spreaders. <laughs> oh, I guess so. Feeding those things is a real problem. Oh, did, well, you couldn't clean the smell mm. off of oh, them. Oh, never. Mm -mm. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I uh, uh, done that until about a year before uh, I graduated. Uh, my brother worked at the injector in the in the shipping department, and uh, they had a uh, welder that got sick or had a heart attack or something I don't remember, and uh, Kenny told them that I could weld, so they had me come in in the evening, and uh, they checked how I welded and so on, so. Uh, uh, that's how I got started at the injector, but it, that, that was only about a month of it. But uh, they said I'd have a job when I got out of school. Who was the so, boss at the time? Do you remember? Uh, In the shipping department. No, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, Kreider, perhaps? Where I, where I worked up in Rogers? brass finishing. Oh, brass finishing. Jim Mager. Jim Mager, yes. Yeah. I thought you were in shipping. No, my brother was well, in Your brother shipping. was in shipping, but they needed the, the welder up at uh, yeah. Brass Finishing. About and, a month. And Jim Mager was up there at the time. Yeah. Jim had, um, well, several brothers, Sid Mager and uh, yeah. uh, George Mager, whom they called Moody Mager. Mm -hmm. And Jim's uh, br uh, son was in my class, too. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. uh, Sid Mager, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's how I started. Then uh, started at 50 cents an hour, but uh, in brass finishing, uh, after uh, a while, you could go on on uh, piecework, mm -hmm. and you could make up to about 210 an hour. Wow, boy, that was big and money. Big money, and uh, uh, I was there about two years, and uh, I seen where I wasn't getting ahead too much. I got on my base pay was 50 cents, but in them two years, I only got a three cent raise in my base oh, pay. Oh, mercy. <laughs> and, but uh, uh, I had heard about uh, uh, Goodyear Aircraft. So uh, while I was with the injector, I took night school on uh, machine shop. 
through Bill Frost. Oh yes, Bill Frost who <laughs> dropped over One dead in the, the classroom. smartest uh, machinist you ever yep. seen in your life. He dropped over dead in the classroom, 1947, yeah. 48, somewhere, 47 I think. And uh, so then uh, uh, Bert uh, Cochran. Who? Cochran. Bert Cochran, okay. He worked at the injector in a brass finishing, and so did I. And he wasn't satisfied, and neither was I. So we heard about uh, uh, Goodyear Aircraft was hiring. We went over and got interviewed, and we left the injector and went there. And uh, I was there about uh, uh, three years, and uh, Bert was there maybe th three or four months, and he had some relation in Arizona. Uh, and they called him and said, hey, we got a good job for you out here. So he moved out there, and that's the last I knew of. That's the last time. Yeah. In the meantime, something else was happening in your life with um, members of the opposite sex. What was happening? Well, uh, Doris Huff and I got married. Uh, her mother lived on uh, Park Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was Helen and uh, Doris. And, hmm, can't think of the youngest daughter right now. She lives in Seville now. But anyhow, Doris and I got married. And uh, in the first year, we had uh, our first daughter, Linda Sue. And two years later, I had another daughter, Marcia Ann. Marcia is married to uh, Buckingham and uh, Ripman. Uh, they have one son. He is in the plumbing and heating business. Used to work for my brother. Mm -hmm. And the oldest daughter has one son. Uh, Linda uh, works at uh, Bell and Howell in Worcester. Used to work at uh, uh, Rubbermaid. But uh, uh, she liked this job better, so she went there. She's been there, I guess, about 18 years mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, she had one son. He works for the, the uh, ODOT. Ohio Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, where did you live at the time then? You didn't live out in Acme Hill anymore. Well, uh, Mom and Dad ha used to have a restaurant there uh, on Acme Hill, but they closed it up and wasn't using it for anything. So they decided when I got married, they decided they'd move over there and live in that part of it, which was separate from our groceries and that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we rented the house from them uh, at the time. And... Uh, it wasn't until after I come back from the service that we moved into a house of our own. And where was that? And that was down on State Street. Mm -hmm. uh, the fellow that owned the uh, uh, Triangle Drive-In down there at the time. Remember his name? Uh, Bill. I don't remember his last name. Uh, he uh, lived where the uh, uh, driving range is now on the west side of town. His parents lived there in that house. He was, a, I believe, an adopted uh, boy. And uh, we, we uh, they moved into the uh, a house built with the drive-through, and then uh, we bought from uh, them, paid $4,000. For $4,000 for that, wow, you yeah. can't get a, <clears throat> a used car for $4,000 now. <laughs> yeah. Now, <clears throat> how did you become involved with m and Auto Parts? Well, when I come back from the service, uh, uh, my dad's health was real bad, mm -hmm. and when they uh, they sold it out from under him, 
in 1950, he moved down the hill on Acme Hill on the opposite side, bought some land, and put up a uh, basement and lived in it for a while while they was uh, building him a three-car garage. And so uh, when he left the station, uh, I didn't have no, uh, uh, he didn't have no use for me mm -hmm. because he was out of work there for sure. quite a while. So uh, we used to do business with M&S Auto Parts. Which and M&S is um, Marcus and Sebrell, right? Uh, it was Marcus. Marcus and Sebrell. Sebrell. Mm -hmm. Walter Marcus and Sebrell. And, uh, but at the time I went to work for Walt, he had already bought uh, Sebrell out. out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in the old building down there where the barber shop uh, is at the south end of town next to where Norm Boyer's garage was. Where the police barbershop was? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, they got a new building there now. Yeah, but, but that, that was an old, old that was rickety. a um, <laughs> rickety <laughs> building that was almost over the... Um, it was. It was on stilts. It was on the, stilts. Yeah. And it was over the um, uh, ravine, mm -hmm. which was pretty deep at that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, what ravine would that... What, what, what water came through there? Was that from Holmesbrook? I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have no idea. Uh, I imagine it comes from Silver Creek over. I don't know. So it goes down to Silver Creek. Well, Silver it could. Creek is lower. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then um, M and S Auto Parts was down. Or M and S was there, right? Yes. And he had a machine shop. Uh, what kind of work did he do? A partial machine shop. Partial machine shop. Machine shop. Uh -huh. What kind of work did they do there? Well, uh, primarily he he sold parts and that. Mm -hmm mufflers, tailpipes, hard parts, and you name it. Uh, but uh, uh, he had a, a brake lathe, he had a riveting machine, and he had uh, A riveting for brake, for brake shoes. Brake shoes, right. And now they don't do that anymore. They just, no. they just throw the whole thing away and... Yeah, it's bonded. And uh, a valve. Uh, mm -hmm. resurfacer and, and refacer, and that was about it. About it. Now, you, met, you mentioned Norm Boyer, and he was on the corner of Water Street and Main Street. Right. And Norm Boyer then sold that out to Bud Clark, did he not? Uh, I thought he sold it to... Could have been. Could have been. Uh, but uh, uh, I can't... Louis Guiney? Yeah, Lou. I thought that Louis Guy had bought it after Bud Clark had it. That could be. I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about Norm Boyer. Well, Norm Lou. was a pretty nice guy. Oh, nice, really. He had two daughters. He, he uh, was very easy to get along with. He did good work. He had a fella that uh, worked with him that you was his handicapped. Name? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't remember his name. He was a handicapped person, he a, and he, a, a he pumped the gas yes. in that for him. Uh, but Norm, uh, there isn't anything I could say bad about no, him. No, he's a good person. He, he lived on Broad Street right next to Overlook School. Mm -hmm. And he had two daughters. Mm -hmm. One was a nurse, and the other one was a um, right. teacher, I believe. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I... Uh, uh, went to buy M and S Auto Parts when it was up in H J Hall's uh, building in two thirds of the building, uh, which used to be the newspaper the newspaper place, and uh, Abrams and Libert was in the front of it. When I went to buy it from Mr. Marquis, he passed away, and I bought it from his uh, widow. Uh, Norm was one of the first guys to come and say, hey, if you need some money, I'll help you out. Oh, good for him. And that's the type of person that Norm was. Yes, and sir. Norm retired then. Yeah. And he, I think he's gone now, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, um, we certainly would be interested in hearing a lot about the M&S Auto Parts, but one of the things that you are probably the oldest living um, 
person in automotives in Wadsworth right now. Probably. Probably so. How about telling us some of the people who <clears throat> were in automotives at that time and a little bit about them, starting with your neighbor, Clyde Weltsing, in carburetor and ignition, and who worked for him and all those kinds of things? Well, uh, Sam Weldy uh, had a golf station across uh, where the library parking lot is right. now. Mm -hmm. Uh, or not the parking no, the lot, part where but the par uh, library itself you do is. park there, the library is there. In the northwest corner of um, Lyman and, and Broad. Broad. And uh, uh, then across the street was another uh, fella had that, uh, Johnny, uh, he lived up on West Street. I don't remember his last name. Uh, he was there. Uh, pure oil. Did he have pure oil there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, Hayes and Arnold was next door to him, the Chevrolet dealership. Then you had the diner there, and uh, uh, down at the south end was Norm. Uh, what about the Ford garage? We missed the Ford garage. Yeah. On the, the southeast there. corner of um, mm -hmm. Broad and Lyman. Mm -hmm. And who owned that at the time? Was Hunter there that uh, time? Hunter, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, <laughs> there's a story about a sidewalk. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, he, uh, let's hear that. <coughs> <coughs> he had put all new sidewalk on the front part around the corner, clear down to, to Eagles. the Eagles. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't hardly set up till, oh, maybe 30 foot down on North Lyman, right close to the spark plug or uh, fire so, plug. South there. Lyman. Uh, they started breaking up. The, Who broke the it up? Of, the city. The city did. Yeah. <laughs> he was a little vexed, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> he was really. He was right. really vexed. Well, let's go straight down on South Lyman then, and um, since we're on South Lyman, what garages were there? Well, uh, I'm not sure whether Pete Rodish built that garage down there or whether Frank Cochran did. Pete Rodish built it. Pete built it? But right okay. next door to Pete was... Then, then uh, Frank Cochran was in there for quite a while. Yep. He did a lot of... He worked for Hull and then went on his own working now, on you trucks. Know, uh, Frank might have built that and Pete uh, uh, added to it. I think that's the way it was. I'm not sure yeah. which way it was. But I'll hear about that one tonight because Pete Rodich's son is very, very accurate on these things. And he'll mm -hmm. tell me. This is Dave, uh, David Rodich. Yeah. And uh, what about Bob Swiger down through there? Bob Swiger was in there too. Yeah. And then he moved uh, Western Star mm -hmm. and he had a business out there. Right. And uh, going then, let's go to the south end. And what garages were down there? How about Herb, Herb Purdue's garage? Herb Purdue, yeah. Tell us about Herb Purdue's garage. Well, he had it at his house and down his, on Lyman. His motto right. was, don't, call, don't cuss, call us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good old person. Everyone loved yeah. Herb, Herb and his wife, uh, yeah. Lillian. Lillian. Lillian Foley. Then what about, let's go then to... Um, the uh, South End again, and uh, Norm Boyer, and tell us a little bit about, uh, we did tell us something about Norm Boyer. Tell us a little bit about Bud Clark and Wanda, and then uh, Lou, uh, uh, Louis um, Guiley. Well, uh, I wasn't around after Norm for a while, oh, I see. so I don't remember them, but I do remember when I got back, Lou was down there. Lou, Lou, Louis Guiley. And, uh, but in between Norm and Lou, uh, I wasn't familiar with those Yeah, people. that was um, Bud Clark and Wanda, uh -huh. Wanda Everhard Clark. Mm -hmm. I see. And Louis Guiley married um, Ruth uh, O'Mara. Uh -huh. right. Then coming up the road, uh, who was on the um, top of the hill, the, uh, the match shop hill or the injector hill, I guess, on mm -hmm. the right-hand side? There was a small gas station there. Who had that? Did Lauren Hayes have that at one time? He could have. Yeah, after he, come to after think he that got I, out of the garage yeah, business. He then could have. coming up again, and uh, let's go to MS Auto Parts. And then right next door was Ohio um, uh, Station. Ohio Station. And uh, renting from there was uh, Clyde Welsing. Yeah. Clyde Welsing. 
And but, uh, Mensch was in there Mensch too. Mensch was there before Clyde Wellstein. Yeah, and he he and Mensch uh, agreed he could have the west end of it because mm -hmm. it was a pretty long oh, building. It was a big building. Yeah. They tore it down. They they've done some other things and to it. That's where uh, Clyde uh, well started his mm -hmm. business. Then and he the, moved over where the Chevrolet dealership was. Right, and they called that carburetor ignition yeah, C&I. Mm -hmm. And um, what about uh, the uh, the uh, Shell station just uh, north of the Lutheran Church? Who owned that? Uh, two brothers. Oh boy, <laughs> I don't remember their name. Okay. Young. Young, Young, Young brothers, yeah. Young brothers, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, um, Siffert had one where uh, Knapp's Firestone is now. Mm -hmm. That was a different building. Bob Siffert. Mm -hmm. Bob Siffert. Bob Siffert. Mm -hmm. Then he came up to where the Sahaya station was. Which is on the corner of Lyman and Broad. Broad. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, Don Merriman had gas uh, pumps out there. Uh, in fact, uh, before I went to the service, there was a, a friend of mine and my dad and our whole family uh, that uh, was a farmer and he got a lot of tea ration stamps for gasoline. And of course, you had uh, uh, fumes from, from the tanks that would mm -hmm take some of your gasoline away from you, and you a lot of times wouldn't have enough stamps to buy back the amount that you needed. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave me the tractor stamps, and I give Don Merriman some, and, and uh, my dad some, and that. And he meant for tractor. They had yeah. the A stamps, B stamps, and C stamps. Right. He was the lowest of the three, and then they had the T, which was for right. farmers for tractor stamps, right? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> and they could turn them in then and, and get, get their gasoline. gas back up mm -hmm. to what they used. Surely, surely. Yeah. And uh, while we're on uh, that side of town, on the west side of town, what about, uh, do you remember the Nicodemuses? And oh, their, yeah. And tell us about them and what, where they were. Well, they were on the corner of, uh, of uh, College Party. and Party. Uh, Party. And that was Park Nicodemus. Yeah. And uh, big family. Yeah. And they had what kind of gas there? They, wasn't that pure oil also? No, I thought it mobile? was mobile, yeah. Mobile, mobile gas. But they distributed gas from a tank truck at one time. And their their um, their firm was down in on Chestnut Street or somewhere yeah. in that area, was it not? And then what about right by the cemetery? Remember that person? Uh, Bear. Bar. Bar. No. Mm -hmm. He uh, um, had a front end and a frame aligning. And painting. Yes. Did not, yes. And he also was going to be the dealership for the Tucker car. Tucker car. Yeah. Let's hear a little bit about the Tucker car that you remember. What did you remember about the Tucker car? Well, it was quite an unusual car. It was way ahead in time, like Studebaker was, and uh, before they went bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Tucker car had a headlight in the center where the uh, radiator cap would be on most cars or the emblem, and it, you made a left turn, it turned with it. You make a right-hand turn, it turned with it. It was, they called the Cyclops. And uh, the only problem was that uh, they couldn't get engines for them because the big three companies, uh, as I understand it, uh, kept him from building those cars mm -hmm. because he couldn't get the proper engine for right. So what, what did they finally discover when they took the, 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 the car apart? Uh, that they you had mean the Tucker car? Yeah, the Tucker. Uh, now that I don't remember. I thought that they had determined that they, they, were, they were using parts from other cars to... Yeah, they had to do that in order to... Uh, uh, get it assembled, but it never got into production. Never got into production at yeah. all. But uh, there is one in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. Is that right? Right. They have one one in Strasburg, Pennsylvania yeah. right now. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Bar Boys, B-A-R-R. -R. Well, 
They were hardworking people. Mm -hmm. They uh, did, as far as I remember, did good work. Mm -hmm. Very honest people, mm -hmm. very good people, very honest yeah. people. And of course, they, the, the, that is still a garage, but uh, certainly up to the bars. Yeah. So I think they have a paint store in there right now. How about north of town? What was north of town when you were in town in the 40s? Well, you had a service station that Tom Gertner run, a Sahaya station. And where was that? That was on the corner of High Street and 261. 261. That was, that was just about yeah. as far as the town went at the time. Yes. And then you would have to go almost all the way up to Clark's Corners until you would come to which store? Well, or to which you, store? They had uh, a tire store there. And it was Mike and, Ernest. Uh, yeah, and uh, then across the street was a... Uh, Woody. Woody, mm -hmm. uh, Bear Joint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was about it up there. That was it? Yeah. We, that, was the, the, that was Wadsworth. I mean, yeah. that was, as a matter of fact, that was out in the country of Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. And then south of town, there was almost nothing. What about east of town? Now, we have so many garages east of town now. But what, uh, what was there before? What, um, well, uh, uh, Loudermilk was there, had the Studer. That was west of town, though. Oh, east of town? Yes, what was east of town? Oh. Well, let's see. Loudermilk had a, a Studebaker place mm -hmm. just west of the Isham School, about uh, 300 feet or so, maybe yes. five, 500 yeah. feet perhaps. Uh, the only one I remember uh, east of town was at the corner of Hartman Road in uh, I can't Broad Street, even... Carly. Who? Carly. Carly, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, a, mm -hmm. that was about all there was out there. Carly time. Alexander. Alexander, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. His daughter married um, Buddy Bittinger. Oh. Yeah, and then they built a house right behind that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until 1960 that, um, um, well, in the 50s and 60s that Jack Summer Chevrolet came on board mm -hmm. out there, then the Ford place mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, Chrysler place across, it was um, uh, Axelrod now, but it was at that time it was Spikerman's, wasn't it? No, mm -hmm. it was a Spikerman. And then my brother Henry built a garage out there on Silver yeah. Creek Road, the Carino Ignition. and. Um, now there are a couple other ones out there. So we wanted to get a, a, a feeling for what garages were here and which garages were here many, many years ago. So we didn't have a whole lot of garages because no. of... Uh, Homer Fiscus. Oh yes, Homer on, Fiscus. Let's talk about Homer Fiscus. was up on uh, Obel Street. Obel Street. Mm -hmm. And he used to have an old Buick, uh, I believe it was a Buick. 24 converted Buick. Converted in, into a... a Wrecker, Wrecker, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, somebody bought it uh, as an antique, I believe, from the family. I would have loved to have had that. It was a nice, <coughs> nice car. And we forgot, forgot also about Rich Pontiacles yeah. and um, uh, uh, right there in the corner of Jim Bible. Rich. Jim Rich, right? Yeah. And of course, he's gone now too. And his brother had uh, a dealership in uh, Ritman. Ritman, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rich Pontiacles. And um, that was pretty well, isn't it, for the garages in town? Right offhand, uh, that, that covers a lot of them. There may have been some more. Then you sold your M&S Auto Parts to? Chuck Bowes. Ch Charlie Bowes, right. And yeah, Charlie worked October for you. October of 82. Yeah, of 82. Chuck worked for him. He worked for you as a young kid. We had Charlie on the program, as you remember. Yeah. And uh, he's very, very knowledgeable about these. But we wanted to get uh, you because I think, I think um, that you are the oldest living uh, automotive person in the city of Wadsworth now. It could be. I think you are. I don't yeah. think there's anyone else who is older than you. Yeah. And if there is, I'm sure I'll hear about it tonight. <laughs> yeah. Virgil, we surely want to thank you for being on the program. Okay. Unfortunately, our time is up. They all, we always run out of time on these things because there's so many interesting things we like to hear about. But uh, there are so many facets of our community which few pe people take for granted or don't know anything about. And mm -hmm. one of them was your area, and that is yeah. the automotive. So thank you for being with us and thank for the you. legacy that you have left Wadsworth and the fact that without mechanics, no one would be able to go anywhere because the cars the wouldn't run. <laughs> so thanks again, Virgil. It's been wonderful having you. You're entirely welcome.